Welcome to another edition of Highly Questionable. What do you like today, Bomani? We're going to put on our capes again and try to save Andrew Luck. We are. All right. Dale, papi. Can the Seahawks afford to lose to the Rams tonight? Not really. Not if they want to start winning championships again. This team, even at the height of its powers, has been a team that is susceptible, weak on the road, and they cannot do what it is that the Giants of Eli Manning have done, where they go through the road to the Super Bowl, on the road, all their games. They've got to be playing home games, and as it stands now, even if they win the rest of their games, they're not going to be playing all home games. Yeah, the only thing about this team, though, is this team good enough to where we feel like even having the home field advantage is going to really push them over the top? Maybe it will, maybe it won't, but with Seattle, where they had led this conference for so long, really just another team in the NFC. They're going to win their division. They're going to get at least one home playoff game. Whether or not they win or lose against the Rams probably doesn't change that, and that's maybe the biggest indictment of Seattle's season. Quick, quick, who is coaching the Rams now? Who is the head coach oh, now? Who is the coach? Oh, it's that fossil guy. <laughs> yeah, when in doubt, if you can't remember who an NFL coach is, just assume his dad worked in the league. John Fossil. I'm assuming his dad is Jim. But I would ask you this. That's correct. I'd ask you this, too. If the coach of the Tampa Bay Bucks came in there right now, wherever you're sitting, and sat on your lap, would you know who it is? I'm dead serious. I got nothing. I know his name. I know his name, too. I don't know what he looks like. I think I can pronounce it. Is Andrew Luck doomed if the Colts keep Chuck Pagano and Ryan Gritson? Colts fans, you are the envy of the rest of the league because in a time like this where you don't know what's going on with your franchise, you've got an owner you trust to steward you through this whole thing. <laughs> Jim Irsay says that for now, Ryan Gritson and Chuck Pagano, they're safe on their jobs. I mean, he kind of has to say that after last year, he got all touchy-feely and decided everybody was going kumbaya and work it out and gave these guys their jobs back again. Look, the hardest thing to find is the franchise quarterback. They've got that. It's it's really tricky building a team around that. Does anything about Ryan Griggs and say, that's a guy for a really tricky job? They've done some things here that are super questionable, and one of them is they're not able to protect that franchise quarterback. He's going to have a career high for sacks in the season. You can't allow that to happen. The good news is they're going to have cap space going forward. The bad news is that's because their general manager hasn't gotten any young players worth locking up, so you don't want to trust him with the future, given what he's already done to your past. What do you make of Brandon Brooks' admission that his anxiety keeps him from playing? This is interesting in this world. Whenever there's a weakness, an admission of vulnerability in this particular business, it is looked at as a weakness when, in fact, it might actually be a strength. This guy has missed two out of the last three games, and it's not a fear of performing. What it is is a desire to be perfect that has caused him stomach problems that is keeping him out of the sport. We don't think of guys that size as being that kind of vulnerable. Very few of them are willing to admit it. Very few of them are willing to go get help. He is doing both. The thing, though, about admitting this is it actually does buy into the narrative of the hero athlete. Like, think about how many people we already had these details about and we build it into what makes them legends. Bill Russell throwing up before basketball games because he was so charged up. Jerry West talking about his desire to win and being a sickness as much as anything else. For a lot of people at this elite level of competition, what pushes them really does kind of border on being insane. It's just that sometimes we don't notice it because we like the end result of it. This happens to be a dude we don't know very much about. We can hear it and it seems a bit more human. Is Russell Westbrook being too sensitive about the media's focus on his triple doubles? All right, focus, focus, focus. Focus. We want him to focus. We want you to focus. Three straight games now for Russell Westbrook without a triple-double, which, of course, means we losing our minds about it because something's wrong because the dude went three games without a triple-double. Russell Westbrook not going for it. Do you accept that uh, I mean, when you get triple-doubles, you guys have a great record. When you don't, it's not very good. Is, is that yeah, I, I, Honestly, man, you know, people in this triple-double thing is kind of getting on my nerves, honestly. I just... People think you know, if I don't get it, it's like a big thing. When I do get it, it's a thing. I'm just, if I just let me play, if I get it, I get it. If I don't, I don't. It is what it is. I really don't care. Not for the hundredth time. I don't care. All I care about is winning, man, honestly. Well, here's where this gets tricky for Russell Westbrook, because if you're that guy, you have to say, I don't care about getting triple doubles. The problem is 
when he doesn't get triple doubles, they don't seem to win. And that's what they're asking him about. So when he says all he cares about is winning, it unfortunately brings us back to the place of the triple double. Man, oh man, we've reached a precarious place here. I know I don't want to talk anymore about Russell Westbrook's triple doubles and don't really want to do so again until later in this season if he's close to averaging a triple double. If I'm sick of it being paid to work in sports, if the guy doing it is sick of talking about triple doubles, how interested are you in talking every night about his triple doubles? The problem is when it comes to the Oklahoma City Thunder, what else is there to talk about with them other than that? Are you surprised at the NBA that the Players Union reached a deal so smoothly? I was really surprised by this. Michelle Roberts is really good as the head of the union, and she had been doing some saber rattling, talking about all of the things that she wanted. And I don't know that she got all of them, but what she did get is there's a whole lot of money, more than there's ever been because of these television contracts. And so it was easier to make all this work because the jumps that you're seeing among the players are so seismic that it makes them feel like they're winning, even though there's so much more money that both sides are actually winning. I mean, it's worth noting that the basketball-related income split really isn't much different. Also worth noting in this deal, it makes it easier for you to get money after the age of 36. Guys involved in this negotiation, Chris Paul, Carmelo <laughs> Anthony, and LeBron James, guys who will soon be 36. But you have to hope, if you want to take all the cynicism out of it, you'd hope these two sides really did look at each other and realize neither one of us can afford a lockout. Let's just go ahead and get this done because it's truly better for everybody. It's such a great point that he makes about the over 36, though, because before these guys took the power positions, this was being run largely by the guys at the end of the bench. So you know who benefited the most in the collective bargaining agreements? The guys at the end of the bench. The dudes you can't believe make $15 million a year. They loved it before. There you have it, LeBron turning his back on the little guys. Oh, come That's on, what happened. That's come right. on, man. I saw a whole lot of little guys get 15, 16, 17 million dollars a year in the last offseason. The little guys looking at LeBron like, thank you for putting my kids through private school. Coming up next on my son Stevie show, we talk to Chakur Stevenson. Oh, I hop. That's right. Oh, What's your favorite order there? Oh, your favorite my, food yeah, there? I get the uh, the French toast combo. Wow. wow. Look at that. He was, very, he was very excited that was to give quick. that, that was quick. Yes, the French. You talk about going overseas. It doesn't put a smile on your face like thinking about aha. My son Stevie Show is brought to you by CarMax. Drive what's possible. Joining us at the beach today is Chakur Stevenson. He's a boxer. We like to talk to guys who fight for a living. Crazy way to make a living. He won an Olympic silver medal in Rio. He just signed with a management team that includes former Olympic gold medalist Andre Ward, in addition to Jay Prince and Josh Dubin. Let's talk to him. When did you realize that you could make a living doing this, that fighting was the way that you wanted to make a living? Because it's a crazy way to make a living, fighting other people for money. Uh... I think I realized it when I got my first check after winning the Youth World Championships. And it was it was like a little check, it was like a thousand dollars. And I spent it so quick. But I don't know, I, after that I just realized like I could make money off of this, like I could make a living out of this and I'm here today. Were you somebody who was doing a lot of fighting in the streets or at school or away from the ring? Uh, nah, I wasn't, I wasn't that kid. I wasn't the one that was outside on the streets fighting every day. Uh, I always been a good kid. Everybody likes me. So even when I was living in North, um, everybody loved me. So, so it never happened. You never found yourself in a situation where someone was trying you and you had to resolve that situation with your hand. I mean, in the second grade, when I was a little kid, uh, a kid tried me, we got in an argument. And he got on the desk. He got on top of the desk and he was talking junk. And when he got on top of the desk, that was the dumbest move he ever made. And I went to him and I grabbed his leg, pulled him off the desk. And once I pulled him off the desk, he fell, hit his head. And then everybody just grabbed me and they grabbed him and they broke it up real quick. Do you feel anything that resembles fear when fighting? Or do you have a confidence about you that you know your skill set is better than most and so you don't fear very much? Uh, to be honest with you, I don't, I don't fear nobody. I don't fear no man. I mean, I had butterflies when I'm fighting right, right before the fight, but once I get in the ring, everything goes out the window. I'm focused on my task, and I guess you could say I'm very confident. Like, I know what I'm going to do. I know my ability. I know that I'm going to be a world champion one day, and I, promise, I made a promise to myself that I am going to be a world champion one day. Were you nervous fighting in front of Floyd Mayweather? 
Uh, no, nah, I wasn't nervous because I actually sparred in front of him before. Because uh, uh, I went to his gym one time and uh, sparred the kid, Devin Haney. And uh, when I got in there, I didn't know Floyd was going to be there. So when he got there, it kind of it kind of hyped me up. So I don't know. I get hyped when people like that watch me fight. Um, Floyd Mayweather, Andre Ward, any of them. I get hyped when it, when I watch them, um, when they watch me fight. When did you become that kind of confident, though? Because that couldn't always be so. Uh, I guess I lost it when I was like 15, and my granddad kept saying I wasn't confident before the fight, and. I guess after that, he kept putting that in my head. Like, I got to believe in myself. And my granddad, like, he believes in me a lot. Like, th there's no one on this planet that believes in me more than my granddad does. So the, f the way he believed in me, I wanted to believe in myself the same way. Like, my granddad believed I could get in there with Floyd Mayweather tomorrow and beat him up, I feel like. But the way he believed in me, I want to believe in myself the same way. So once I started to do that, I became the person I am today. What kind of pusher was your grandfather? How hard would he lean on you? Uh, he leaned on me hard. Like it was a time when I was like 12, 13. I didn't really like boxing at, at that point. Like, and I wanted to try football, basketball, and he used to get so mad because he wanted me to box. Like he saw everything in me. He wanted me to box so bad. So, I mean, he pushed me a lot. What's the best moment you've had where you've been able to share it with him because all of the things he believed have either come true or come close to coming true? I would have to say when I won my first junior world championships and I was, I was the only person on my, t on my team that won that year. And uh, I came to the back after and I had to take a, a, a drug test after and uh, I seen him crying. I'm like, man, like, what are you crying for? He just started like vending to me, like, man, I'm so proud of you, man. Like, I always believed in you. I always seen this, and he started crying. I'm like, man, I ain't never in my life ever seen my granddad cry, ever. Like, I've been around my granddad since a little kid, never seen him cry, and he started crying. I don't know, that just made me feel happy. Like, he was proud of me. Aren't you responsible for your father going back and getting uh, a GED? Isn't that because of you? Uh, yeah, he said uh, I motivated him. Uh, I pushed him to do it, and he kept telling me that he was going to do it. So, yeah, I yeah. Well, how did you motivate him, though? How? By telling him or by what? How did you manage that? Uh, I guess he watched, watched me and watched me overcome what I became, like, as far as coming from North and the situation I was in, and he wanted to push himself. Go ahead, Poppy. What do you have for Shakur? Hey, Shakur, I heard that you like to go to IHOP a lot. Oh, IHOP. That's right. Oh, What's your favorite order there, oh, your favorite my, food yeah, there? I get the uh, the French toast combo. Wow. wow. Look at that. <laughs> that he, was he was very excited that was to give that, that was answer. Quick. Yes, the French toast. talk about going overseas. It doesn't put a smile on your face like thinking about IHOP. That's right. My I father love asked IHOP. all the questions. Yeah, I mean, you love IHOP, huh? Yeah, you got a weakness. Do you hit the specials when you go there? Do they know you? They, they give you a reduction in price? Oh, yeah. Uh... Yeah, they know. They know me. They see me every day. To be honest with you, yeah. right? mostly every day. So they they love me. They love you. Eh? Right, yeah. Enough with your follow-ups. Thank you, Shakur. We appreciate it. No problem. Gracias, Shakur. <laughs> <laughs>
Somebody show Brooke Lopez a picture of Larry Nance Sr. so he won't feel so ashamed. Oh. Now, this is the Nets bench. Oh, no, Nets, you can't yeah. react that way. That's not the way to react there. Yeah, but I tell you, that appeared to be another situation where guys who dunk up people in the past got more excited about it. Because if you look at it, not everybody gets as charged up about this dunk. Let's go ahead and roll the videotape. Right. My man sitting next to the trainer staff, for some reason, is right. not nearly as impressed as everybody else. Well, Luis Scola was super impressed yes. right there, too. Did he, you see that? He's dunked on somebody. That other guy is like, I just don't know the feeling. Well, that's a weak bench. You know, you, you need a bench that is not going to uh, break. You need a bench that always is going to stay strong. <laughs> oh, yeah. Remember this bench? <laughs> <laughs> That's a bench. Shout out to the producers for getting this in there. Like, this is some real flexibility. I mean, this is really that. where we took that story? Okay. Do you question if it is okay to enjoy this? They say we're going out to youth football, and I'm already guilty about whatever's going to come. Guilty next. pleasures. Oh, oh dear Lord. Did the ground cause the fumble there? Uh, no, I think the fumble caused the fumble. Woo! And got to say, kid got up. They're resilient. I mean, if we're going to watch youth football games, we can't be mad when football breaks out, right? It's not okay to enjoy that. You should feel ashamed of yourself if you enjoyed that. You sure you're a bad person for enjoying that. Anyway, run that back. You got to keep your head on the swivel, 11. Come on, I'll say. Wow! He had such good blocking there. That was a big hole right up until it wasn't. That's what I'm saying. I mean, when they're going to go back and watch film and number 11 is going to watch and be like, you know what? That's all me. That's all me. I got to do better. That's what we teach these kids accountability. That's what football is all about. You know, it could have been worse. Andy Reid could have been in that game. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Well, I could have run away from yeah, that. Andy Reid at the same age. I still can't contest. believe this happened. Yeah. Look, at, look at the throw. I mean, that is Andy mm -hmm. Reid right now. I, you have to feel like Andy Reid didn't want to be there after he showed up and saw what it looked like, right? How is that helmet small on Andy Reid? How is that possible? Time to play the game that this an international playboy. See? Oh, no. Tell us what's on television tonight. We will tell you if we're intrigued. On TNT, Knicks at Warriors. Uh, sure, I'll partake in some of this. I am told that we have some video here of an enraged Porzingis. Do you want to? Uh, do you want to watch a, an enraged? Oh, that's, what's just happening there? Oh, they just threw him down. This was brewing, folks. Oh, he did try to puff. Yeah, he stood over him right there. Comes security from the Knicks. Corey Gaines, the former Suns assistant, also out there to. I've got nothing else to say about that. Bomani, are you intrigued? I will say this, though. Porzingis said he learned about America through watching World Star. You're lucky he ain't get up, go grab a chair, and set that whole thing off. Poppy, are you intrigued? Oh, see, see, I'm very intrigued. Listen, I was very impressed when Melo rushed to the aid of his teammate there, you know? Look at Melo. Let me see where Melo is. Melo's at the top there. Okay, there is Mello uh, getting in the middle of the scrum with great energy and passion. Mello been in the league for 13 years. He knows a fight isn't actually a fight in the NBA. He does know that. <laughs> also, he is just strolling past it like you would stroll past like the avocados in a grocery store. Like those other guys are close enough where they had to act like they were going to do something. Mello was just like, all right, I'll be down here when y'all ready. On Animal Planet, Monsters Inside Me. You may have noticed today, you had the feeling that the producers kind of mailed it in. They just said to me, we have a clip. That's the information that they gave me on this particular story. We have a clip. Mark Johnstone has been suffering from excruciating bouts of pain. And now he's just felt something moving inside his body. There was something crawling around inside my scrotum. And after the movement stopped, sure enough, there came the shooting pain. Just knocked me on the floor. I heard this crash, so I ran to the back to see him. Mark's moaning and rolling around in pain. 
I think there's something crawling around in my scrotum. Maybe I am going crazy. Mark is prepped for surgery. Brenda stays by his side for support. The doctor is just cutting for what seems like an eternity, and I begin to wonder, is this worse than what I thought? What's in there? Is he going to amputate my scrotum? Is it something the doctor's not telling you? Is he going to die? And he says there was something in there moving around. He says, oh, my God, it's alive. Something was burrowing itself into the scrotum. I had not seen anything like this before, nor do I anticipate I ever will. Mark had bot fly larvae in his scrotum. I thought it was going to be a porcupine. Why didn't this lead the show? Why did this not lead the show over Seahawks Rams? Come on, that's more interesting than anything Seahawks Rams. Bomani, are you intrigued? I mean, let's be honest about this. You say you got some kind of bug crawled around your scrotum. Your wife got a whole lot more questions than they showed in that there video. Woo! Poppy, are you intrigued? Oh, see, see, I'm going to police, and when that happens to you again, rather than going to the doctor, the emergency room, you know, there's something by the name of x you know? You get some x and that thing is going to flush out like crazy, you know? It's going to come out, boom, boom. The, the bug was on the other, in a different... Yeah. Yeah? Uh, scrotum <laughs> is not a word that we use in Spanish no? very much. I don't think he knows what that is. Okay. That's all the time we have for today. Thank you for watching. It's honestly better that he didn't know where the scrotum was, all things considered. Thanks for watching. Gross. <laughs> it's better that way. What is it? Show me. <laughs> <laughs>